okay, it sort of ran out of time on the last one, but uh, I was talking about uh, I was talking about uh, that I was uh, that I was going to uh, mention some more fact checking that I was reading about on the candidates um, and the campaigns, and it, it, it seems that Democrats are also guilty of, of stretching the facts for the purpose of simplifying it for the um, for the purpose of simplifying it for the audience. So it is it's something where um, both sides are guilty. Um, and th again, these are there's some real genius things here from the San Francisco Chronicle newspaper. At a campaign stop in Ohio this week, President Obama referred to uh, Romney's record as CEO of Bain Capital and its role as a pioneer of outsourcing jobs overseas. You cannot, quote, stand up to China when all you've done is send them our jobs. The distortion in this is, quote, all you've done is send our jobs is a stretch. The pioneer reference is to a Washington Post story that said Bain, not Romney, was a pioneer in outsourcing. The article does not say that Romney was at the helm when the outsourcing took place. Also, several other nonpartisan investigations have not found a link between Romney's Bain tenure and his direct involvement with outsourcing to China. Um, in a new TV ad running in a key San Joaquin Valley district, this conservative group said Democratic House candidate Jose Hernandez is running against incumbent GOP Representative Jeff Denham, supported a $716 billion Medicare cut. The distortion is the reference is to Hernandez's support of the Affordable Care Act, the new health reform law, but the health plan does not cut $716 billion from the Medicare budget. It aims to get that in cost-saving reductions from hospitals and insurers. Denham supported the House budget created by GOP Vice President nominee uh, Paul Ryan, chairman of the House Budget Committee, that included those cuts in uh, the budget plan he drafted. Uh, in his acceptance speech at the Democratic National Convention and on the campaign trail, the president has said that he, the nation's use of renewable energy has doubled. At the convention, Obama said we have doubled our use of renewable energy not quite true. The nation's consumption of renewable energy has increased, but not that much. Measured in BTUs in a unit of energy, the amount of renewable energy consumed in the United States has increased 25% since 2008 when Obama was elected, according to the Energy Department. Renewable energy accounts for 9% of the nation's total energy consumption. So um, we can't let the candidates, either on the left or right, get by with these these changing facts. You know, just Kind of tailoring them a little bit to the to, to, to whatever the audience wants to hear. That is not right. Um, and Obama and uh, Romney should be told that. So there it is. Uh, now on a completely different subject, uh, one of my favorite authors is freethinker Sam Harris, and uh, he has a brand new article out today. Um, and I get these emailed to me once in a while because I sign up for them. Uh, this article is called "On the Freedom to Offend an Imaginary God." Harris writes, the, la the latest wave of Muslim hysteria and violence has now spread to over 20 countries. The walls of our embassies and consulates have been breached. Their precincts abandoned to triumphant mobs and many people have been murdered, all in response to an unwatchable internet video called Innocence of Muslims. Whether over a film, a cartoon, a beauty pageant, or inauspiciously named teddy bear, the, uh, the coming eruption of pious rage is now as predictable as the dawn. This is already an old and boring story about old, boring, and deadly ideas, but I fear it will be with us for the rest of our lives, according to Harris. He says, Our panic and moral confusion were at first sublimated in attacks upon the hapless Governor Romney. I'm no fan of Romney's, he says. I would find the prospect of his presidency risible if it were not so depressing. He, uh, but he did accurately detect the first bleats of fear in the Obama administration's reaction to the crisis. Romney got the timing of events wrong, confusing, as many did, a statement made by the U.S. Embassy in Cairo for an official government response to the murder of, Libyan, of Americans in Libya. But the truth is that the White House struck the same note of apology, disavowing the offending speech while claiming to protect free speech in principle. It may seem a small detail given the heat of the moment, but so is a quivering lip. Our uh, government followed the path of appeasement further by attempting to silence the irrepressible crackpot pastor Terry Jones who had left off burning copies of the Koran just long enough to promote the film. The administration also requested 
that Google remove innocence of Muslims from its servers. These maneuvers attest to one of two psychological and diplomatic realities. Either our government is unwilling to address the problem at hand, or the problem is so vast and terrifying we have decided to placate the barbarians at the gate. The contagion of moral cowardice followed its usual course, wherein liberal journalists and pundits began to reconsider our most basic freedoms in light of the sadomasochistic fury known as religious sensitivity among Muslims. Contributors to the New York Times and NPR spoke of the need to find a balance between the free speech and freedom of religion, as though the latter could possibly be infringed by a YouTube video. As predictable as Muslim bullying has become, the moral confusion of secular liberals appears to be part of the same clockwork. Consider what is actually happening. Some percentage of the world's Muslims, maybe 5%, 15, 50, not yet clear, is demanding that all non-Muslims conform to the strictures of Islamic law. And where they do not immediately resort to violence in their protests, they threaten it. Carrying a sign that reads, Behead those who insult the Prophet, may still count as an example of peaceful protest, but it's also an assurance that infidel blood will be shed if the imbecile holding the placard only had more power. The grotesque promise, of course, fulfilled in nearly every Muslim society to make a film like Innocence of Muslims anywhere in the Middle East would be as sure a method of suicide as the laws of physics allow. So what exactly was in the film? Who made it? What were the motives? Was Muhammad really depicted? Was that a Quran burning or some other book? Questions of this kind are obscene, and here is where the line must be drawn and defended without apology. We are free to burn the Quran or any other book, and to criticize Muhammad and any other human being, let no one forget it. At moments like this, we inevitably fear, we inev inevitably hear from people who don't know what it's like to believe in paradise, that religion is just a way of channeling popular unrest. The true source of the problem can be found in a history of Western aggression in the region. It is our policies rather than our freedoms that they hate. And I believe that the future of liberalism, or much else, depends on our overcoming this ruinous self-deception. Now, religion only works as a pretext for political violence because many millions of people actually believe what they say they believe, that imaginary crimes like blasphemy and apostasy are killing offenses. Most secular liberals think all religions are the same, and they consider any suggestion to the contrary a sign of bigotry. Somehow, this article of faith survives daily disconfirmation. Our language is largely to blame for this, as I pointed out on many occasions, he says. Religion is like a term like sports. Some sports are peaceful, but particularly spectacularly dangerous. Some are safer, but synonymous with violence. Um, some entail little exertion or risk of personal injury than standing in the shower. Um, the, uh, to speak of sports as a generic activity makes it impossible to discuss what athletes actually do or the physical attributes required to do it. What do all sports have in common apart from breathing? Not much. The term religion is scarcely more useful. Consider Mormonism. Many of my fellow liberals would consider it morally indecent to count Romney's faith against him. In their view, Mormonism must be just like any other religion. The truth, however, is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has more than its fair share of quirks. For example, its doctrine was explicitly racist until 1978, at which point God apparently changed his mind about black people a few years after Archie Bunker did and recommended that they be granted the full range of sacraments and religious responsibilities. By this time, Romney had been an adult, exceptionally energetic member of his church for more than a decade. Unlike the founders of most religions, about whom very little is known, Mormonism is the product of plagiarisms and confabulations of an obvious con man, Joseph Smith, whose adventures among the credulous were consummated in uh, the full, unsentimental glare of history. Now, given how much we know about Smith, it's harder to be a Mormon than it is to be a Christian. A firmer embrace of the preposterous is required. The fact that Romney can manage it says that something about him, just as it would be if he were a Scientologist proposing to park his e-meter in the Oval Office. The spectrum between rational belief and self-serving delusion has some obvious in increments. It is one thing to believe Jesus existed was probably a remarkable human being. It's another to accept, as most Christians do, that he was physically resurrected and will return to earth to judge the living and the dead. It is yet another leap of faith, too far to imagine, as all good Mormons must, that he will work his cosmic magic from the hallowed ground of Jackson County, Missouri. That final provincial detail matters. 
It makes Mormonism objectively less plausible than run-of-the-mill Christianity, as does the related claim that Jesus visited the Nephites in America at some point after his resurrection. The moment uh, one adds seer tones, sacred underpants, the planet Kolob, and a secret handshake required to win admittance into the highest heaven, Mormonism stands revealed for what it is, the equivalence, uh, the religious equivalent of rhythmic gymnastics. The point, however, is that I can say all these things about Mormonism and disparage Joseph Smith to my heart's content without fearing that I'll be murdered for it. Secular liberals ignore this distinction at every opportunity and to everybody's peril. Take a moment to reflect upon the existence of the music, the musical The Book of Mormon. Now imagine the security precautions that would be required to stage a similar production about Islam. The project is unimaginable, not only in Beirut, Baghdad, or Jerusalem, but in New York City. The freedom to think out loud on certain topics without fear of being hounded into hiding or killed has already been lost. And the only forces on earth that can recover it are strong secular governments that will face down charges of blasphemy with scorn. No apologies necessary, according to Harris. Uh, Muslims must learn that if they make belligerent, fanatical claims among the tolerance of free societies, they will meet the limits of that tolerance. And Governor Romney, though he is wrong on almost everything under the sun, including, including very likely the sun, he is surely right to believe that it is time our government delivered this message without blinking. Uh, the, the words of Sam Harris. Pretty cool stuff, and uh, probably not a, something I would post on YouTube because it would be too risky. Uh, because, you know, I tried to put some posts on for th free thinkers, and I had an extremist right wing person that was on, and I be since befriended him about a year ago. So you're trying to spread atheism throughout uh, uh, Facebook. You know, so. Unbelievable. So people will be ridiculously irrational. But um, what I'm talking in terms of, instead of spreading atheism, I, I think. A better way to say it is spreading the free thought. This idea of free inquiry, critical thinking, that's what we need to spread. Not that uh, atheists are right and you're wrong and whatever. We're all, you know, like my mom would say, I mean, we're all learning. We're all, we all continue to learn. I mean, we don't know what's going, what's going to happen after we die. We have no idea. But to be open to the question, um, say, I, I never was brought up with a religion at all. Um, I'm very open to the question. Uh, I think that life is a wonderful adventure, and uh, that's what I've always believed. And uh, but we can't assume that that we're going to go to heaven and see all our relatives and everything's going to be fantastic. Um, as my brother said, we might we might die and we're dead and that's it. That's it. So, the, but that makes this experience pretty special, doesn't it? So, um, thanks for listening. And uh, I'll be back with another edition of this. Now, the presidential c debates are coming up, so I'll have plenty of stuff to share on that. Um, I expect uh, that Joe Biden will put in a pretty good uh, fight against uh, Paul Ryan. I don't think he's quite as bright as some people think. So I'll leave it at that, and uh, have a great week, everybody. Bye-bye.